What interests me about your, your narrative is that it comes the turning point of what you might call uh, drinking the Kool-Aid, of believing the theory, comes right after the 87 stock market crash and the beginning of the downdraft in the Nikkei in Japan, both of which were very, very difficult episodes in what you might call dynamic hedging. The, the derivatives books experienced a lot of gapping and, and Tell me about losses. It. People like me read the Brady Report with great care, trying to work out what they knew. And we got very, very skeptical. But at the same time, what we found is the academics went the other way. They basically said, oh, no, it was just a faulty model, and we can develop a more elaborate model. And the problem that I kept saying to these people was the more elaborate the model, the more the assumptions, the more the problems, the more the, the more breakdowns, fragile it is. and the more yeah. fragile. Absolutely, yeah. that, that word sums it up. So it was kind of this divergent in this process. And I always found that the modeling, et cetera, was a way of dressing up certain things. And I always remember clients who actually would say to me, you know, what does this mean or whatever? And I would explain it. And then as a consultant, I would help them look at it. And they were in awe of these models. And I kept saying, forget about the models, forget about all of this. Why do you want to do it? What does it do? What economic purpose right. does it serve for you? And if that makes sense, well, OK, we'll fit the numbers around that. But a lot of them got carried away. And it was almost like a sort of modernity. You wanted to appear to be modern to do this. And also what happened is the industry grew. And as industries grow, you get specialization. When I started, I could do a whole range of things, simply because there wasn't that much attractivity. But now it became more industrial. The scale became more industrial. And also, what I always find very frustrating about finance and financiers is often they're very narrowly based. They look at the world of money in a very narrow context. And to my mind, money is a part of a broader society. It's part of a broader political system. And I think to look at it very narrowly is a mistake. And you end up making tragic, tragic mistakes. And you can see one example of that at the moment in Europe. And I keep saying to people, the relationship between Greece and Germany or France and Germany, you have to look through 400, 500 years of history. And you cannot strip the decision making today at, away from that history. And I mean, George Soros is actually very astute when he says, well, you know, there is a history here. And no matter what you do, that history will come back to haunt you. The echoes you. will be there. Yes. And that's right. And the echoes are there. And it is that whole process that is so important to understand. And I think you were telling me that Henry Kaufman wants everybody to study economic history. He's endowed and a couple of chairs and is very emphatic that the ability to use spreadsheets and downloadable data is not sufficient to measure financial risk. Peter I, Bernstein's work is as important as measurement through Black-Scholes models. I couldn't agree more because understanding that context gives you everything. And it's almost like, you know, when I grew up in banking and so forth, you had older, wiser heads who would often look at you without understanding the technical details of what you were saying. But they would make a vital interjection at a particular point, which forced you to reassess your beliefs, what you were doing. And economic history does that to some degree. Yes. And also, the ability to see that big picture within that economic history enriches your ability to analyze things.